When you hear the word shark, what is the first image that comes to mind in your head? Perhaps it's a great white shark, the infamous star of the 1975 film Jaws. Maybe it's a speedy mako shark, a modern-day underwater bullet of a predator. Or it could be the hammerhead, with its unique alien-like appearance. These are all amazing creatures, but the fact of the matter is that sharks, even the ones of the modern day, have been a hugely diverse group of marine predators over the course of their 450 million year natural history. Since the Silurian period, long before the rise of the dinosaurs, these prehistoric wonders of the seas have been slowly evolving, branching out into some of the strangest and spectacular forms the oceans have ever seen. Sharks are, in fact, among the most diverse of marine species. From the giant filter-feeding whale shark to the tiny dwarf lantern shark, which could fit in the palm of your hand, you will almost certainly recognize some prehistoric sharks already. Otodus megalodon, better known as simply megalodon, the giant shark of the Pliocene, has been an inspiration for, as well as being directly depicted in, popular culture for decades. It is at the forefront of the public's imaginations when we think of prehistoric sharks. But, again, it's just one representation of a massive group that dates back to a time before vertebrate life had found its way onto land. Today, we will be taking you on a natural history tour of those 450 million years where we will encounter some of the most bizarre, fearsome, and wondrous creatures the world has ever seen. We will encounter not only the sharks themselves, but their immediate relatives, rays, sawfishes, skates, and guitar fishes. Starting from the very first sharks, right up to the modern day, we will observe deep-dwelling leviathans, sharks with scissor-like mouths, giants that were known to prey on whales, and surprisingly, some of the smallest and strangest animals that have ever roamed the waves. Join us now on an oceanic voyage of prehistoric sharks. As we mentioned at the start of the video, sharks first appeared on the scene around 450 million years ago. And that's a massive leap in the geological timescale, one which predates not only the dinosaurs, but reptiles as an entire class of animals. When the sharks first appeared, the world was dominated by shallow seas, and vertebrate life had not yet emerged onto the inhospitable land. Invertebrates were very widespread. Trilobites, worms, jellyfish, and sponges all thrived in these early seas, which provided the basis for many food webs, for the many creatures that were beginning to evolve. The largest creatures on Earth at this time were not the sharks, not by a long stretch. Eurypterids, often referred to as sea scorpions, ruled the roost at this time, as well as the orthocones, huge cephalopods with conical, tapering shells, with some individuals growing up to three meters in length. The first creatures in the shark lineage to evolve were very much living in the shadows of these much larger predators, creatures like Climadius. Climadius was not a true shark, and you definitely would agree by taking a look at it, Climadius was rather what we refer to as a spiny shark, small creatures that marked the first point on the timeline of shark evolution. It more closely resembled a sardine than a shark, at around 7.5 centimeters in length, roughly the size of a human finger. Still, little Climadius was showing the first signs of the nature of the lineage it was destined to found. Along each fin of the proto-shark 
were pairs of sharp spines, 15 in total, to put would-be predators off making a meal of it. Climadius's lower jaw was lined with many needle-like teeth, giving scientists the impression that it was already a nimble little hunter of smaller fish and crustaceans, something that its descendants would famously inherit. The spiny shark's large eyes note that it may have been a nocturnal creature, or at least one that relied heavily upon its sense of sight to track down its prey. The fish was first named in 1845, indicating that we had a good deal of information on when sharks first evolved for a long time. Unfortunately, however, many spiny sharks from the time of Climadius are not known from fantastic specimens. Multiple other species shared the Silurian and Ordovician seas with Climadius, but we only know them from unreliable scale fragments, which, as you can imagine, are harder for scientists to study than well-preserved fossil fish. Mongolipus, Polymerolipus, and Algestolipus are among these would-be sharks, and we only have scale fragments from each of them. Scientists and paleoartists can assume that these creatures would have looked similar to Climadius, but we can't make any certain decisions on their appearances while the evidence is as lacking as it is. These little sharks were beginning to slowly but surely cement themselves as creatures that were here to stay in the Silurian and Ordovician seas. Their generalistic diets and good forms of defenses meant that they were able to both hunt a wide range of prey items whilst defend themselves from attackers reliably. All they needed to do now was bide their time. Their day would come eventually. By the Devonian, both plant and animal life had established itself on land. The arthropods, including arachnids and insects, had managed to cement themselves as creatures that could reliably live a fully terrestrial lifestyle. But the same could not be said for the vertebrate life that was steadily evolving. Early amphibians had begun to evolve, creatures that could leave the water temporarily but needed to head back into the water to lay their eggs and to ensure their skin did not dry out. The Devonian is best known, however, as the age of the fishes, and rightly so, some of the most fearsome piscine predators ever to live inhabited these seas, some of which were sharks, the first true sharks. Although the spiny sharks represented by Devonian genuses, such as Chiracanthus, had not yet become extinct. Cladosalaki is widely considered to be the first species of true shark to evolve, and when compared to its now extinct ancestors of the Silurian and Ordovician periods, it was relatively titanic, at almost two meters in length. It was a slender creature, with a visibly shark-like tail, and long, broad fins to aid it in propulsion through the water. The jaw of the animal was clearly still evolving into a more shark-like form, and as a result, its face appeared more like that of other fish species than it did the stereotypical overbite look of modern sharks. The shark retained the fin spines of its ancestors, but used them more for keeping its fins stiff against the flowing ocean current than it did for defensive purposes. Cladosalaki would by no means have been the top predator of the Devonian seas. That honor goes to the 10-meter placoderm, Dunkleosteus. But our shark's slender and streamlined build would have permitted its speed and agility, allowing it to escape the jaws of such predators with relative ease. Perhaps the most famous shark of the Devonian period is Stethacanthus, due in no small part to its peculiar dorsal fin. At about 50 centimeters in length, this shark was a small creature that would have hunted the smaller fish of the Devonian seas. But 
was particularly remarkable due to the tall, broad dorsal fin with a strange, wide, flat peak. This feature is only found in male specimens, leading scientists to believe that the purpose of such a fin was to aid the shark in display purposes when finding a mate. The strange shape of the fin has also led to several nicknames being coined for the little carnivore. Amongst them are the anvil shark and the ironing board shark. Like modern sharks, Stethicanthus would have been constantly losing and replacing teeth throughout its life. And many of these teeth have been discovered in particular locations together in large numbers. The locations of the teeth imply that Stethicanthus was a coastal creature, which may have actually migrated to breeding grounds in large numbers. In 1982, a spectacular Stethicanthus specimen, named the Beersden shark, was discovered not too far from Glasgow, Scotland. It was almost immaculately preserved, allowing us to tell almost exactly what the creature looked like in life. To find such a well-preserved fossil fish from around 365 million years ago is extremely rare, so this is a very important discovery. It remains, to this day, one of the most well-preserved shark fossils ever discovered. The Carboniferous period is a time in Earth's history that is known for its giant arthropods that were permitted such growth due to the rise of oxygen-rich forests across the globe. Strange amphibians lurked in the inland swamps, while the first reptiles evolved scaly skin and hard-shelled eggs, resulting in the first truly terrestrial vertebrates. The sharks of the Carboniferous, however, have their own victories to celebrate. The Carboniferous marks the point in oceanic history where the sharks really took over the waves as some of the top predators and dominant species of the seas. This would be the case now until the end of the Paleozoic era, which culminated in the great dying extinction event of the late Permian, heralding in the Mesozoic. The sharks of the Carboniferous experienced great boons to their diversity and speciation following an extinction event at the end of the Devonian. The sharks and their relatives, being the great survivors that they were, diversified and spread out into wild and weird new forms. Many of the most well-known cartilaginous fishes of the Carboniferous are not true sharks, but are creatures more closely related to the chimeras or radfishes. Balancey, for example, was a shark relative that lived a life more similar to the frogfishes, a group of anglerfish that are famed for their ability to camouflage against the rocks and coral of their modern-day reef homes. Meanwhile, creatures such as Cobalotus, a two-meter species that looked more like a true shark, combed the seafloor in search of fish and crustaceans. Stranger still were the creatures that were more closely related to the true sharks. Ornithoprion, with an elongated spear-like lower jaw that would have likely have aided it in hunting fish, like a modern-day swordfish, patrolled the high seas, while Bandringa, a cartilaginous fish similar in form to modern-day paddlefish, lurked along the sea floor. The most famous shark relative of the Carboniferous is without a doubt Edestis, otherwise known as the scissor tooth shark. Estimated to be six meters long, this creature, often depicted to be similar in form to a more slender version of a modern-day great white, was known for its blade-like teeth, situated in interlocking rows on both the upper and lower jaws. With its powerful body and weaponized jaw, it would have been able to shred and slice at prey, making it the top predator of the Carboniferous Oceans. It is, however, possible that Edestis adopted a different and altogether more brutal hunting technique. 
as we only know Adestis from its jaws and teeth, we don't know exactly what the body behind these teeth look like, or what exactly it was capable of hunting. As such, it is theorized that Adestis may have alternatively slammed itself, teeth first, into prey, causing heavy bleeding damage. Either way, it was certainly a remarkable creature. By the Permian period, a gigantic supercontinent, Pangaea, was the only major landmass on planet Earth. And much of it was characterized by vast swaths of scrubland, open woodland, and desert. A gigantic ocean, Panthalassa, orbited Pangaea, and in it, the relatives of the sharks were the rulers of the seas. The lord of this dominion was without a doubt Helicaprion, a species closely related to Edestis of the Carboniferous. At seven and a half meters in length, Helicaprion was the largest shark relative to exist up to this point and is one of the most famous prehistoric creatures of the group. Inhabiting the coastal and open oceans of Panthalassa, this creature, very much like Edestis, goes by a few other names, mainly the buzzsaw shark or the whorl-toothed shark, due to the most famous fossil associated with the species, a large spiral of sharp, slashing teeth. The fossil has caused much confusion since it was described in 1966, especially when it came to deciding just where it was located in the fish's mouth. Initially depicted as a downward-facing spiral protruding from the lower jaw of the animal, it is now thought that the teeth were positioned further back in the mouth, with a semicircle wheel of teeth appearing from inside the open mouth. How the creature actually used these teeth is another debate entirely. Theories have ranged in the past from using the now outdated downturn spiral as a whip to lash out at fish, to a cutting tool to slice through shell or bone. It is now estimated that, since the teeth scientists have found have very little wear and tear on them, that these fish would have used them to prey on soft-bodied animals, such as early cephalopods. Still, this creature would have been an incredibly imposing sight on an otherwise featureless seascape of the gigantic Panthalassa Ocean. A relative to Helicoprion of the time was Sarcoprion, a fish that was similar in shape and size to the former also inhabited these seas. It possessed a much longer snout, meaning that it may have even tackled larger prey than its cousin. It also possessed an equally strange dental setup using its whorl to cut into prey while it was pinned against the upper jaw. It wasn't even just the oceans that the sharks and their relatives had dominated during this time. Further inland, a species of true shark was making a name for itself amongst the deep swamps and lake beds of Europe and North America. Orthocanthus was a species of three meter long ambush predator that submerged itself in the murky sediment or vegetation of water where light could not easily penetrate. When a suitable fish passed by, this hunter would launch itself out into the open, snapping up its quarry before resuming its vigil, waiting for another prey item to pass by. After the Great Dying, the colossal late Permian mass extinction that wiped out 90% of life in the oceans, the sharks suffered some heavy losses. With so many extinctions taking place, many ecological niches were now vacant in the seas, ripe for the taking. In the Triassic period, which saw the rise of the very first dinosaurs, an unlikely group of animals took to the seas to fill the niches of the lost sharks, reptiles, Many different species arose, crocodile-like archosaurs, 
and gigantic predatory ichthyosaurs took to the waters alongside the nothosaurs, placodonts, and tanistrophids to claim this new underwater world. The sharks, however, as they always had done, persisted. Although the great reptiles of the oceans had usurped their thrones, some species survived the great dying long into the Triassic. Triodus and Xenocanthus, another two genuses of freshwater ambush predator directly related to Orthocanthus, were some of them. They continued to lay hidden in the murky swamps, ambushing prey until well into the late Triassic. Their diminutive lengths of 60 centimeters and 1 meter respectively, aiding them in remaining inconspicuous and hidden. Another shark to survive the dying was Northern Europe's Wadnika, another small genus at around 1 meter in length. The Triassic sharks typically remain small, due to the dominance of the much larger ichthyosaurs, filling the niches of the large ocean-going predators of the time. It wasn't until the Jurassic period, which began around 201 million years ago, that the sharks began to reclaim their hold on the high seas as the creatures we know them as today. Hybodus was a powerful marine predator, measuring about two meters in length, patrolling the Jurassic seas in the shadow of creatures such as Lyplerodon. This shark was lined with fin spines and hooks, which would have aided it in defending itself from these types of predators. At this point, it was almost as though history was repeating itself. The sharks, small and armed, were slowly picking up the evolutionary pace once more, in a manner similar to the spiny shark's first few steps in the Silurian. The Hybodons, the group of sharks containing Hybodus, were amongst the most widespread during the Jurassic. The largest of the order, a genus of shark named Asteracanthus, may have reached around three meters of length in life, and was a skilled predator of Mesozoic fish, with its high-crowned and multi-cusped teeth. Living near the bottom of the sea, in the middle of the open ocean, up to 13 individual species have been named and described from the Asteracanthus genus. The sharks were diversifying once again. We can't make a trip to the Jurassic Oceans without mentioning a certain denizen of the deep. Surely one of the most peculiar fish the oceans have ever seen. Squalaraja is a species of extinct chimera like no other. Flat and ray-like, with an elongated body like a guitarfish. About half of this creature's body length was its shovel-like snout. Male individuals were known to possess a long, horn-like appendage on the front of the head, likely used for display. The eyes of the fish were perpetually pointing upwards, and their massive, broad pectoral fins were splayed out to the side. These creatures must have lived lives like modern-day rays, picking food off of the ocean sediment while maintaining a close eye on the predators above. Nothing quite like them has been found in the fossil record since. By the Cretaceous period, the third and final period within the Mesozoic era, sharks were once again cementing themselves as some of the apex predators of the seas. They weren't alone in this endeavor, however. Plesiosaurs had evolved both long and short-necked forms by the Cretaceous, allowing for a wide range of niches to be filled. Gigantic predatory fish patrol the seaways and oceans, and mosasaurs, an infamous group of marine reptiles related to snakes, were the top predators in many marine ecosystems. It was around this time that the sharks and their relatives began to diversify into a number of bizarre new forms, unlike anything alive in the world of sharks today. The most famous of the Cretaceous sharks is also one of the most fearsome. Cretoxyrhina was a mackerel shark, 
an early member of a vast group of sharks which have survived into the modern day. This makes it an early relative of the modern great white shark. At 7 meters in length, it was the largest shark of the late Cretaceous and was very near to becoming a top predator in its local ecosystems, which have been discovered all across the globe. Nicknamed the Ginsu shark after its knife-like teeth, which were able to cut through many different prey items, including shells and bones, this shark would have been able to tackle a very wide range of prey items, from large turtles to giant predatory fish, pterosaurs, and even small mosasaurs and dinosaurs. As large as Cretoxy rhino was, it was not the largest shark of the entire Cretaceous period. That honor goes to Tychodus, a colossal relative of the Jurassic period's Hybodus, that grew to around 10 gigantic meters in length. Despite the fearsome appearance, it is likely that this creature posed no threat to most of the vertebrate life of the seas of its time, living just before Cretoxy Rhina appeared on the scene. Instead, it is theorized that this giant lived much like a modern-day nurse shark, with a specialized mouth adapted to crushing the tough exteriors of shellfish and crustaceans. Its teeth were rounded with tough, crushing ridges that would have increased the bite pressure on its prey. With a diet of bottom-dwelling shellfish, you wouldn't really expect tycho dust to need to grow to such extreme lengths. However, when you consider just what it was hunting, that shed some light on the situation. Inosaurambus was likely the chief prey item of Tychodus, a species of giant bivalve the size of an adult human man. Evolving to exploit this new food source, it helped that the shark itself was a suitable size. The diversification of sharks and their relatives throughout the Cretaceous period allowed for some of the resulting animals to become very strange indeed. Achaeolamna, described in 2021, was one such shark. At 1.7 meters in length, it wasn't the largest of creatures, but the strange feature is its pectoral fins, or wings. The pectoral fins of this filter-feeding planktonivore stretched out to nearly 2 meters wide and looked much like those of a modern-day manta ray. Several depictions of this creature have shown it speculatively leaping out of the water, which must have been a wonderful sight in the coastal waters of northern Mexico in the late Cretaceous period. Another strange specimen in the cast of bizarre Cretaceous sharks is Scapanorhynchus, a three-meter-long deep-dweller that was very similar in form and lifestyle to the modern goblin shark. Four species in total are known, ranging anywhere in size from 65 centimeters to three whole meters in length. Its powerful, screwdriver-shaped teeth were perfect for piercing and ripping at prey items in the deeper water where it likely resided. Another important example of the diversification of the strange sharks of the Cretaceous can be found in a creature called Pseudomegachasma, a six-meter-long filter feeder related to the modern sand tiger shark, while being similar in appearance to the elusive megamouth shark. Initially assumed to be a piscivore, it is now presumed that this creature would have drifted across the warm, open oceans of the Cretaceous tropics, mouth agape consuming obscenely large quantities of plankton. The sharks had slowly taken their time to recover throughout the Mesozoic, and by the end of the era, these oceanic superstars had cemented themselves as a group of animals that would be here to stay, against all odds. As we all know, however, the Mesozoic came to an abrupt end when the Chicxulub asteroid slammed into Earth 66 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous. Would the sharks pull through? We arrive now at the dawn of the Cenozoic era, 
the time of mammals in the wake of the late Cretaceous extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs. Many species of shark went extinct as a result of the impact and the disasters that followed, and the group was not without its losses. But ultimately, the sharks did indeed manage to hold on to their claim as the top ocean predators throughout the Cenozoic. Not only did they survive throughout this new and changing world, the land of which was now bathed in warm forests and grasslands and populated with giant mammalian beasts, they thrived. The sharks that survived the Cretaceous extinction event and lived on into the Cenozoic in the absence of Mosasaurs and Plesiosaurs were now free to blossom into all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes and forms. Strange sharks now dominated the waves, from the surface waters, through the pelagic zones, right down to the abyssal plains. The first basking sharks from the genus, Satorhinus, appeared in the Miocene, toward the middle and end of the Cenozoic. These colossal filter feeders only have one living representative today, and Cetorhinus huddlestoni was very similar. This huge filter feeder with a truly massive mouth would have wandered the surface waters of the ocean, filtering plankton into its gigantic maw. What makes this particular species interesting is that its teeth were proportionally much larger than the modern-day basking shark. This means that the creature would have been able to catch fish to supplement its planktonivorous diet and fish may have even become a staple of its diet when the massive shark was shedding its gill rakers, the colossal pieces of biological equipment inside the mouth of the shark that aided it in filtering food. Another strange filter feeder of the Cenozoic can be found in the Paleorhinochodon, believed to be the ancestor of today's whale shark. We don't know exactly how big they grew as the only fossil evidence we have of it is its teeth, but it was likely a very large fish, similar in form to the modern-day whale shark. The Cenozoic also saw the rise of many species of ray, the most spectacular of which was Aetobatus, a genus of eagle ray with a 10-meter wingspan, larger than that of the largest modern ray, the manta ray. These giants would have flown across the open oceans and sea floors of the Miocene, picking off large shellfish from the sediment below. Another shark relative, and possibly the strangest cartilaginous fish to exist throughout the Cenozoic, was a daffodon, a species of three-meter-long rabbitfish, which inhabited the abyssal zones of the oceans across the northern hemisphere. It is actually known from the Cretaceous up until the Pliocene, meaning that, living so far below the surface of the water, it would have been unaffected by the Chicxulub impact, surviving right through to the time when the first hominids were starting to populate the Earth. Deep below the sea level of our Pliocene ancestors, this pale titan would have been eerily sifting through the gloom, drifting aimlessly along the bottom of the ocean. There is one prehistoric shark that has made a name for itself above all others. The genus name, Ototus, may not mean much to the public, but the species name Megalodon certainly will. Ototus Megalodon, whose name, understandably, translates to Big Tooth, was, like the great white shark, a species of mackerel shark that lived from 23 million years ago and only went extinct around 3.6 million years ago. Ototus is in fact a genus with many different species of giant Cenozoic sharks, the largest of which is the Megalodon. Famously, this was a colossal species of predatory shark. But just how big was it? Estimates vary from around 15 meters right the way up to 20 meters from nose to tail tip. For reference, the largest shark alive today, the whale shark, 
grows to between 5 and 10 meters long. So Megalodon was indeed a colossal specimen. It boasted a mouth loaded full of sharp, serrated teeth, capable of bringing down some of the ocean's largest animals. Fish, including other sharks, were without a doubt on the menu for this titan. But it occasionally set its sight on far bigger quarries, whales. Like a modern-day great white, it is estimated that Megalodon would have swum below the surface of the water, scanning for these whales. When it spotted one, it would have angled its body facing upwards, the force of one of the most powerful bodies in nature, then working to propel itself toward its prey. Building up speed as it went, it would have slammed its mouth directly onto the bottom of an unsuspecting and unfortunate catch, completely catching it off guard and stunning it. With the prey falling back down into the water, the shark could then deliver a fatal bite. Truly, this was one of the most frightening and powerful predators the world has ever seen. We live in a world where sharks are the most diverse group of predatory animals on the planet. Nowhere else do living conditions permit this degree of diversity. The modern-day mackerel sharks, such as the great white, are our archetypal sharks. But look below the surface, and hundreds of different forms exist. The gigantic filter feeders, such as the whale shark, basking shark, and megamouth shark, have adapted to exploit plankton, and have grown enormous off of it. On the seabed, angel sharks and wabagongs catch their prey with some of the most excellent ambush techniques in the animal kingdom. The thresher shark uses its long tail as a whip to incapacitate schools of fish, while the mako shark is an underwater bullet adapted for supreme speeds. Sadly, our sharks are in decline. Overfishing for products such as shark fin soup are damaging our shark populations across the globe, and sharks are sometimes caught as bycatches in fishermen's nets. A bleak figure of 100 million sharks are killed by the hands of man each year. Where of the average 73 unprovoked shark attacks on humans each year, a mere nine are fatal. These amazing creatures are quite unlike the mindless killers popular culture has painted them as over the years. We must act now if we want to save the sharks. Surely it would be a shame to abruptly cut short 450 million years of evolution over a bowl of soup. <laughs>